Welcome back to the Empire Builders podcast. Dave Young here with Stephen Semple talking about uh, uh, empire building. We have another remarkable female entrepreneur that we're Oh, cool. So I don't know much about this one other than I've seen a lot of their marketing over the years, right? And, uh, and they've become a meme. There's a meme called Pepperidge Farms Remembers. And so we're, we're going to talk about Pepperidge Farms, probably not the meme, but that was uh, you know, a throwback to their, uh, to their marketing campaign. How did they start, Stephen? Well, and when you become a meme, you know you're a big deal. Oh, yeah. 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 Pepperidge Farm was founded in 1937 by Margaret Rudkin in Fairfield, Connecticut. And she went on to sell the business to Campbell's Soup in 1961 for $28 million in 1961 money and became the first woman to sit on the board of directors of Campbell's Soup. She also later wrote a cookbook, the Margaret Rutkin Pepperidge Farm Cookbook in 1963. And it was the first cookbook to make the New York Times bestsellers list. Wow. All right. So she's a big deal. She's a big, big, big deal. And Pepperidge Farm, they lived on this 123-acre farm, and it was named for the Pepperidge tree that was on the property. Margaret was a mother of three, smart lady. She was valedictorian of her high school and had a career and worked as a bookkeeper for nine years. You know, we're talking Mm. in the early 1920s before marrying Henry Redkin, right? So took a very different path. And Henry was a stockbroker and they went on to have three children. And in 1929, they moved to this farm in Connecticut right when the crash happened. Now, her husband's a stockbroker. And while they were not wiped out by many, times were still tight for them. Now, her son, John, had developed asthma and a number of allergies. And their doctor, who was way ahead of his time, recommended staying away from processed food. So again, this is like 1930, right? And one of the things that she realized that she needed to do was make a better bread for her son, John. She wanted to make this whole wheat bread and she had never baked before. So she pulled out these recipes from her Irish grandmother. (laughs) And it took time and the early results were not great. In Margaret's words, the first loaf should have been sent to the Smithsonian Institute as a sample of Stone Age bread. It was hard (laughs) as a rock and about one inch thick. (laughs) I like her sense of humor. (laughs) Stone Age bread. Stone Age bread. So after trying a few recipes, she finds one that is nutritional and her son likes. The doctor also liked it and saw the results. And so he wanted to buy it for other patients. Hmm. And since they could use some extra cash, market crash, husband and a stockbroker, yeah. they decide to sell it to Dr. Donaldson. And he okay. recommends it to his patients and other doctors. Margaret also decides to see if she can sell it to a local grocer. So here was the challenge. We go from Stone Age bread to prescription strength bread. I guess that's a good... I didn't think about it that way. <laughs> <laughs> but... Here's an interesting challenge. And here's where I give Margaret a lot of chops, a lot of chops on that. This and one other thing where she was just brilliant. So here's the challenge. It's the depression. The economy is terrible and the going price for bread is 10 cents. For her to make her products that she can make money, she needs it to sell for 25 cents. Two and a half times the price, right? So here's what she did. She sliced up her bread, gave the grocer a taste. Uh He decided to buy it all. And by the time she got home, there was a phone message asking for even more. Oh, wow. And with that call, the business was born. And she decided to call it after the family farm, which was named after the Pepperidge Farm trees, right? Then Henry, her husband, started taking the bread with him to Grand Central Terminal in New York to be sold in specialty shops in New York. She now needed to move the bread production into one of the barns. It was growing so much. Within a oh, wow. year, within a year, sales hit $100,000, which is about $2 million today. By 1939, sales are over 150000 and she's baking a half a million loaves of bread she can barely keep up. I can barely keep up. Yeah, think about that. And then late 1939, Reader's Digest 
publishes an article called Bread Deluxe that told Margaret's story to the world. And this experience teaches her about the power of story because the business explodes. Very little of the article was about the bread. Most of it was about her story and the farm and her son and all that Mm -hmm. other stuff. And she saw that and she went, holy crap, there's a power to story, which, as we know, has remained part of the culture of the business to this day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So she has to expand. She takes out a $15,000 loan, moves into the factory, and decides to employ only women. Wanted to maintain this historical connection to baking. They're now doing 50,000 loaves a week, about 2.5 million loaves a year. Wow. Okay. Then World War II breaks out. Uh-huh. And two things happen. One, she has to cut production because she doesn't want to compromise quality, and it's hard to get the things that she needs to do it. But then Lee Marshall, remember the name Lee Marshall? Wonder Bread. Yeah. So he's recruited by the government to manage food supplies because the supply shortage is creating problems. And so all bread producers have to send him all of their information, sales, production, recipes, everything. Uh Now, Margaret, smart businesswoman, really smart businesswoman. She realizes if she sends this information, it's going to give him an unfair advantage. No kidding. So she yeah. immediately changes the size of the loaf to a smaller loaf. And there's no sales history to share now. Uh-huh. And if you notice, Pepperidge Farm loaves are smaller, right? Okay. That's the history of the smaller Pepperidge Farm loaf. So she just basically stopped producing anything bigger than that. Yep. She even managed to find a way to keep the recipe secret, which was brilliant. And, you know, as I said, to this day, the loaves are smaller. They've kept that history. Stay tuned. We're going to wrap up this story and tell you how to apply this lesson to your business right after this. Man, I love that. What? Actually, they've all been good. What are you talking about? The ads at the beginning. Oh. Yeah. I wish I had ads like that. You can. I can? Yeah. Book a starter session with Steven. Really? Uh Uh-huh. That's the first step. To what? Getting great ads. You think I could have ads like that for my business? It's kind of boring. Absolutely. Plumbing isn't sexy and we've heard great ads for them. You're right. So, gonna do it? Do what? Book a starter session. I guess so. Why not? Good. Can't wait to hear your ad in this podcast. Book your starter session on this podcast website. Just visit the Empire Builders Podcast. Dot com and click on Get Started. Let's pick up our story where we left off, and trust me, you haven't missed a thing. World War II ends, sales rebound, and they are now making it available in the entire East. She opens up more factories. She can now do 77,000 loaves a week. Mm. But she realizes she needs to do more than bread. And Margaret sees the rise of sweets in the American diet. And while away on vacation, In Belgium, she comes across these crafted cookies that are made for Belgian royalty. Oh, okay. She gets a recipe for six cookies, plus hires the baker's engineer and buys a cookie oven. And she releases cookies called Bordeaux and Brussels. All right. She packages them differently, puts them at a premium price, just like the breads at a premium price. They look and they feel different. And she has this huge success with these cookies. But her last one, is the one that I like the most. Mm -hmm. She next turns to the children's market. And here's the interesting thing. You know, Dave, how we often talk about inspiration comes from looking outside your market, looking outside Mm -hmm. your geography. Well, she came across the cookie idea while in Belgium. So she's wanting to create something for the children's market. So she heads back again to Europe. And while in Europe, she discovers these little crackers, little good fish, made by a baker for his wife on her birthday because his wife is a Pisces. And this is the birth of the goldfish cracker. I love that. Right? She looks at that and goes, I'm going to make a little cracker, little goldfish cracker. And as I said, in 1961, Campbell Soup comes along and buys them, and she becomes the first female on the board of Campbell Soup. And today they're doing $2 billion in sales, this empire that she built of the bread and the cookies and goldfish crackers. Nice. I've always liked goldfish crackers, probably because I'm a Pisces. (laughs) 
<laughs> oh, is, that, is, that, is that the connection for you? It's like, no wonder. No, that explains it. Well, I remember, you know, we would buy, my kids loved them so much. I would go to Costco and I'd buy the big thing of goldfish crackers and then I'd fill little, like the little tiny sandwich bags. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, man, the price difference between the big bag and the ones that were already pre-packaged, I, I could package it for that price. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But, you know, the thing I find remarkable, and we have to remember, she did these things at a time when being a female business person was not easy, like really, really hard. And she you know, develop these things. But the part that I love is again, and we've talked about it so much, look outside of your world. Now the bread came from a need to solve the, the the problem for her son that, you know, turned into a business. When she wanted to do the cookie, she looked outside of her market. When she wanted to do something for children, she looked outside of her market. She traveled elsewhere looking for ideas and inspirations outside of her four walls, outside of her community. Yeah. And so often we see that. And what amazes me is how often businesses resist doing that. Like, like we even find resistance when we're working with somebody and we say, okay, we want to spend a day with you to learn about your business and we need you to travel somewhere. And they're yeah. like, well, do I really need to travel? Yes. It changes your mind, changes mm-hmm. your whole, pr- even if you're talking about your business being in a different place, creates a different energy. And it's like, I love the quote from Seth Gordon, no great idea comes from a room with drop ceilings and four white walls. Yeah, exactly. And the flip side of that is when we want to get to know their business, we travel to see them, Mm -hmm. right? Because you can't, you cannot, the business owner cannot give you an an accurate picture of what their business is really like, right? Right. Because they're inside it. It's in them and they're in it. And uh, you can't see them real. You have to go breathe their air and and walk their streets and talk to their customers because they're going to tell you just happy, wonderful things about how great they are and how awful their competitors are. And eh, sometimes you you just they they live they're viewing their little world through their own shade of rose colored glasses. I will even go so far as to argue that this traveling for us, this traveling out of this our space out of our office out of our place and going to theirs also fuels our creativity in terms of how Mm -hmm. we're able to look at their business oh absolutely Um, you know it's interesting i just did last week for a client an annual retreat where they came and saw us in toronto and we held it inside of a recording studio that's where Mm. we met and you know it's really interesting the different energy it created because you're wandering around looking at these platinum albums on the wall and all of this other stuff. And it's just like, you know, you're in this really cool creative environment and you're sitting inside of a recording studio talking about, talking about the business. And there's no question that creates a different type of creative energy. So I really admired her. I admire her for this conscious thinking of I'm moving into this market. I'm going to travel Europe and look for inspiration. Yeah. Love it. It's a, it's a good way to get some cross pollination of your ideas. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, got to admire her, right? Like, I mean, the things that she managed to accomplish, like what a force in business and someone to really look up to and sort of go, wow, wow. She did some really cool and creative things. And how many people would have rolled over, especially like think about the time we're in right now, where there's economic worries, you're in the depression. There's no yeah. worse economic worries. And you have the guts to go to a grocer and say, here's a bread I think you should sell. And we're going to have to sell it at a 250% premium. And that did yeah. not stop her. She was like, this is good enough that I know if I can just demonstrate this to people that people will want to buy this bread. There will be people in the marketplace who will want to reach into their pocket. And it wasn't like it was a niche. It's not like you could ship this bread far and wide. And she sold a crap ton of it in the first year. Yeah. We also know that in times like that, spending doesn't quit altogether. And often we will do the little indulgence of buying a small luxury. Yes. Right. We'll we'll treat ourselves to something that reminds us that uh, we're not starving to death. We can afford a a nice loaf of bread and it's just a few pennies more. But let's let's do something to make us feel good. I I think that's so important. Have you ever heard of the name Faith Popcorn? 
Yes. Uh, futurist. Yeah, correct. Now, I can't remember when she wrote this book, but it was like... Mm. Was it the Popcorn Report? The Popcorn yeah. Report. And yeah. in the Popcorn Report, she talks about this whole idea of small indulgences. Yes. That during yes. times of economic challenge... So in other words, you're going to stop going out for dinner. Mm-hmm. But what you will do is go out for dessert. So high-end dessert places will do really, really well. And restaurants won't do as well because you'll be looking for that small indulgence. In the grocery store, yeah. something like a Hagen dazs ice cream will do really well because it's something mm -hmm. you can bring home to have as a special treat that night. And it's a yeah. small amount. It's expensive, but a small indulgence. Yeah. So yes, it is something to keep in mind that these small indulgences occur. And then to bring it full circle, you know, uh, to have a marketing campaign and to grow a business to a size that you become a meme, right? For and that meme is from uh, is from Family Guy. Oh, is that right? <laughs> you you become big enough that an animated satirical show makes fun of your marketing campaign, and then that becomes the meme. Wow! Right? It's Pepperidge Farm remembers, and that was the tagline in those ads. It was, it was? An, old, an old guy in a wagon, I think. Yeah. Uh, Pepper, Pepperidge Farms remembers, and so <laughs> it's it just has become this this uh, uh, ever present meme now. That's probably I would guess millennials probably know it more from the meme than than the products or the ad campaign. That's got to be good for a billion dollars in sales, just right there, man. Right, and then they, <laughs> they go to the store and like, wait, wait. Pepperidge Farms is real? <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to try me some of that. I got to try that. Yeah. <laughs> Heck yeah. All right. Cool story, Stephen. Thank you for bringing that onto the Empire Builders podcast. And I know you'll remember. <laughs> Pepperidge Farms remembers. <laughs> <laughs> you do that well. <laughs> All right. This was fun. Thanks, David. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Please share us. Subscribe on your favorite podcast app and leave us a big, fat, juicy five-star rating and review. And if you have any questions about this or any other podcast episode, email to questions at the Empire Builders Podcast.com.